Flu Kung Fu, the art of preventive health. We are the co-authors of the Biker's Handbook. I'm the weaver of bionic codes. Here in the center, we Demis have... the fire of nutrients. <laughs> and in the Master opposite of corner... Biomarkers. <laughs> welcome <laughs> to the dojo. Trump-labeled coronavirus kung flu. You know, it's the greatest virus. It's the best virus ever. Best ever. Yeah. I got the virus. I killed it so fast. You can it yeah. blink your eyes. The virus is now in quarantine for life. Um, when the daughter of Bruce Lee heard about that, she said that my father thought, fought against racism in his movies, literally. Now, Bruce Lee was a kung fu legend for the Western moviegoers. And he had to fight racism off camera and on camera. And he always stayed very stoic and very centered. Be like water, my friend. And he was quite a legend. He was basically the original biohacker. And people ask me, like, who is, you know, the best biohacker in the world? I always say Bruce Lee. He had no limits. He was always pushing what it, knows, what it is to be a human being. You know, he invented quite a lot of biohacking techniques uh, or popularized them or was the first one to really experiment and pioneer with things. For example, he had a blender and his morning smoothie was putting raw meat and raw eggs, like five, six eggs in a blender, blend it up, drink it up. But he was not only on a ketogenic diet, he also had some fresh juices. He had very kind of the early versions of a juicer, and he was choosing fresh vegetables and herbs like ginseng and all kinds of weird stuff. And he also used electrostimulation on his muscles. So he was running electric current on his muscles to overdrive his nervous system while he was training. And that was the reason why he was so fast that when the people were filming him on camera, they had to ask him to punch slower. And there is a pretty awesome video on YouTube where you can see like a one-inch punch where the guy is flying across the dojo, who is actually kind of the heavyweight karate world champion. Mm. What do you think about Bruce Lee, guys? The first thing that comes to my mind as a you know, lifelong martial artist myself was that he was the first guy who basically took the best stuff from all the modalities and styles of fighting. So basically kind of precursor for MMA. What actually works? Not just on paper or some, you know, group of people in the Himalayas or something like that, but to actually, like Litmus test it in a real fight. So Yed Kunedu was his almost like a practical philosophy to actually synthesize different ideas. And this is, of course, what's biohacking all about. We can test and make these interventions on ourselves and see what actually works. Yeah, my, my take on Bruce Lee is that be like water, my friend. So that's been kind of a, a quote for me for quite a, quite a few years. What it means is that you adapt to different kind of situations. You're not like rigid, no, I have to do this because that's uh, usually what we have been taught, like very strict st structures, especially in Finland. So being more fluid and also creating kind of the flow for your own life. So that's, that's my take from Bruce Lee. Absolutely. He was also experimenting with training protocols and he was doing everything you know, imaginable that we today call biohacking when it comes to perfecting your body. Now, Kung Fu actually means doesn't mean this specific way of fighting, or it doesn't mean kung fu movies. It means skillful work, hard training, or endeavor where you spend a lot of time on something over obstacles. You have basically perseverance. And it's basically any study, learning, or practice that requires patience, energy, and time to complete. It's, the original meaning is not fighting. The original term for fighting or art of war is called wushu. And 
Does this definition sound familiar to you? That's basically biohacking. Health and performance optimization, skill achieved through perseverance, all of those lead to resilience, the ability to adapt in the face of adversity. Uh, the obstacle becomes the way. You know, for Bruce Lee, obstacle was always the way. And, you know, when we think about ourselves, we live in an ecosystem that has been fighting for existence and evolving to be able to deal with very stressful situations on this planet. And it emerged into different species. And all of those are integrating to us today. What only holobiont means? It is a combination of everything we are like in ourselves. Every kind of possible bacteria or like fungi or virome. So it's basically a, a collection of different ohms, like microbiome, virome, and so on. And also the environment we are living in. But it also means uh, history, like the perspective of evolution back into the archaea bacteria and everything that has developed from that. And uh, what we talked about in the upgrade dinner was that if you reduce your diet into only like a few ingredients you use, you're also reducing the holobiont inside you. Yeah, and I think that's a good metaphor for the past idea that I shared, that if you just take one part of that, like you just focus on wrestling or just focus on boxing or just focus on meat only or veganism or whatever, you're kind of missing a huge portion of intelligence that life has created. So as an omnivore, we have all of these tools. And of course, in certain times, it's very helpful to know wrestling or <laughs> know certain aspects. But if you want to actually create wider toolbox and basically make life inside of you more intelligent and more wider, I think that's a good base to start from. And if you eat a lot of fungi, you actually become a fungi. <laughs> so that's, that's really good. Yeah. <laughs> Fun guys. Yeah. De develop your humor. <laughs> Absolutely. This is a painting from a famous visionary artist called Alex Gray. We have some visionary artists here today. And this painting was done in 89. And what you can see there is two towers and two airplanes. And right in the root, you can't see exactly here, but there is a gentleman who looks like George W. Bush, and then there is Saddam Hussein next to a huge penis. And this is basically our potential future. If we do things right, we're going to prosper on this planet. If we do things wrong, this is the end result. Another famous painting, and a very beautiful painting that predicts the coronavirus is here, from Mark Henson. And this is called the fast food chain, could be called the pathogen, could be called the supermarket. But I mean, we, are, we have been kind of waiting for something like this to happen eventually. Because, you know, the world is what it is. And the way how we deal with our ecosystem, how we respect the environment, we have lost that connection to our true selves and to our true holobiont. To understand that the invisible world, the bacterial, the viral, the virome, those have been part of us modifying our DNA for centuries, a natural process. If you look at the transmission of diseases from animals to humans, the so-called zoonotic viruses, these things have happened, but we are amplifying them with our modern technology. We are amplifying them with our modern lifestyles. Yeah, and all of these organisms are interconnected in nature. And that's why, for example, for me personally, over the years, you know, gigging into the world of bacteria and focusing on that, then understanding, well, these fungi around them basically uh, act as a meta-organism making sure that different types of species of bacteria are living in this type of soil or this type of part of our gut, for example. So you can't just take off certain aspects of life that have been evolving for billions of years, 
but to understand that uh, it, it is this whole symbiotic thing. And that's why when we've monocropped our food production and done the same things inside of our you know, ecosystems, that's how we basically make the virus vectors, for example, amplify a lot. And the amplification has definitely happened faster than ever. The world is a massive petri dish for infectious diseases. And this is a natural process. I mean, every 100 years, 10 to 14 percent of world population has died for the purpose of evolution, for the purpose of being able to adapt from the level of the genes through epigenetics to extremely harsh conditions. Just like computer systems, we need to be tested over and over again. Otherwise, we are not resilient. We will be weak pussies that you buy from supermarket. <laughs> we will be the domesticated mm. things, you know, domesticated humans, basically. Yeah, we need updates. So uh, no program works forever. So if you take a look at the list of notable epidemics, uh, around 100 years ago was another major one. And uh, of course, there was World War I, back in then, uh, kind of two big shakers. But I, I think this as a, kind of like a homeostatic model. So when the homeostasis goes way to, let's say, to the right and to more of the destruction, it needs to be balanced into the other side. And uh, when you look at the collective way or, or, or the planetary way of, about this, uh, these are necessary events. Absolutely. Joshua Lederberg was the guy who received the Nobel Prize for showing how bacteria can exchange DNA uh, through, through transduction and other mechanisms. And basically, he was advising the world space program, uh, the, the NASA space program. And he was worried that we will bring from space um, a virus that we are not ready for, just like we have brought viruses for indigenous people who have died, like conquistadors when they went to America, you know, what happened. Um, so he actually had the idea that we should guarantee uh, anyone who goes to space. So Jose Cordero wants to go to space, so we have to put him into quarantine when he comes back. Um, so, but in the end, like if you think that the coronavirus has now killed over one million people in the world uh, this year. Uh, if you look at the leading killers all around the world, the real pandemic is ill health, that we have so really crappy health and lifestyle. That's the real risk group. It's not about age, really, isn't it? It's about degenerative diseases, and here is the list of them. Yeah, for, for especially the cardiovascular disease and everything related to inflammation. I would say the silent inflammation is the silent killer and it's the silent epidemic that we are going to, and we are actually recognizing it as a potent uh, killer. And when you tackle that, that, that is the way also to make your body more resilient. That's actually from yesterday's talk about the Health DX, why the inflammation control is on the top of the list. And when that is in control, it will also give you the best resilience score. Correct. The only one form of contagious that travels faster than a virus is fear. And we've seen that, you know, you open up news and social media and that's what you get. But you have antivirus programs like <laughs> yeah. Newsfeed Eradicator and uh, do not open the mainstream news media. Or at least think about it as an uh, information diet. We are much yeah. more interested often what we put inside of our bodies than what we put inside of our belief systems and narratives and all that. So that's definitely one of the problems that gets overlooked these times. Yeah. Yes. So memes are the genes of culture. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of what we are living through here is, is that evolution is even faster, how it's changing our minds and our attitudes and how we respond. That all links to the stoic ideas, that you always have the opportunity to decide how you respond. And I think people are responding from very primitive emotional centers that are out of balance. Now, our approach to dealing with any new pathogen 
is basically true resilience, like trusting your immune system. That's, that's the only cure in the end for many problems. And it starts by doing your homework. When this virus outbreak happened, I started reading the original research papers coming from the labs. And that was my news source. And that we ended up writing the Biker's Flu Guide. I started writing it together with my colleagues in uh, January. Um, it's almost, almost prophetic, um, but, but anyone who did, this, did the research already saw, okay, that's what's going on. Now, you can do a lot of things, whatever it is that you're dealing with, and starting from precaution, you start from yourself. You start to fortify your own system to bring that into a resilient state. And this is not a new idea. I just, you know, what popped to mind is in traditional Chinese medicine, they have this theory of three treasures that you basically bury the treasure for the future. And that's a concept that, like, you need to train yourself and prepare your, for example, immune system to be resilient when the shit hits the fan. So that's been across all of these medicinal systems forever. Yeah, we are not uh, in reinventing the wheel, but... Uh, this is the preventive health. Uh, that's why biohacking is also preventive health. And the immune system is at the core. Uh, when you have a strong immune system, everything re literally functions better. Uh, over here we can see different kind of, like a scale balancing factors. So you can actually reflect on these, whether you are <clears throat> on the fortifying side or on the impairing side. For example, this might not be the best thing for you immune-wise because you're kind of uh, sleep-deprived. Mm. I'm always like in awe, how can, how can you pull off this event? But when you recover from that, and even if you have more resilience, you can tolerate occasional sleep deprivations. But that means uh, you have to really like build uh, the kind of buffer. So I use this metaphor of this suck line. Here is the suck line when you go below, your life sucks. When you're up, it's all good, and you can build the buffer above it. Yesterday, uh, Ossi Viljakainen read my pulse. He's an Ayurvedic practitioner, and he said that you have a very strong immune system. I've been dosing a lot of mushrooms, so I have some good you're allies. You're a fun guy. <laughs> I have a lot of allies that I'm dealing with, but in modern medicine, we have many ways of assessing and understanding what your immune system is, is capable of doing. And uh, these are some of the things and markers you may want to research for. Yeah, uh, basically you want to have a strong vitamin D levels in your system. That is the ultimate regulator. Mm -hmm. I think we go into that yes. a little later. Uh, you want to have optimal levels of leukocytes, but also thrombocytes and a low level silent inflammation and also uh, not having too much oxidative stress and also having a good uh, amount of uh, plasma antioxidant capacity. You can measure all this stuff. And when you look, take a look at these different angles, you can actually have a bigger picture. Okay, this is kind of the state of my immune and defense system. Mm. We're going to go a little bit faster because there's a lot of ground to cover, so we're going to do like one yeah. slide per person. So it's like a roulette. You don't know what's going to come to you. I will start. So <laughs> now is a really good idea to stop smoking if you are. And that includes cannabis. You know, the, the receptors through which many respiratory viruses go into your system, not just the coronavirus that we are now dealing with, um, those are upregulated often when you're exposed to um, pollution and also tobacco smoke. Now it's also a good idea to move to Finland. You don't have to fly back, by the way. <laughs> um, seek asylum. Work for the Biker Center. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh, pretty important to understand that if you use alcohol, at least use as a, a, it as a carrier for other stuff. <laughs> so that's why the tinctures evolved back in the days to carry a certain medicinal compounds. So I still do tinctures and of course, all the people understand that probably 
two plus or even two doses of alcohol per day wax up your sleep and all that. So keep it low, simple stuff. Yeah, talking about sleep, uh, upgrade dinner happened uh, Thursday. I had actually two doses of uh, absolutely incredible natural wines, but I saw it in my sleep, less deep sleep for sure, like below my average, and the sleep wasn't as restful. So it definitely affects. And melatonin. Um, have you tried melatonin? I, I think many have like for jet lag, but you might reconsider or rethink the melatonin because it's a strong immune modulator. And there's actually a lot of data about it. And microdosing melatonin could be actually a very wise idea at this point of time, like 0.1 milligrams in the evening. You, you don't get any of the side effects that bigger doses like 10 times, even 100 times doses create. But melatonin is something you, we are not usually taught in the context of immune modulation. You should also get enough sun for vitamin D, but also for other reasons. Uh, the sun has all kinds of other biological effects that you can't just get from a bottle. But if you think of the T cells, uh, the killer T cells, they are kind of sleeping soldiers, and they have this thing called vitamin D receptor that you have in your cells. And if you don't have enough circulating vitamin D, um, when there is a pathogen that enters your system, uh, those guys are going to be asleep. So that's why vitamin D levels are so, so, so important. And they, all the meta studies um, that have been collected, for example, on the website of World Health, Health Organization, basically say that vitamin D can prevent respiratory illnesses and speed up recovery in some cases as well. If you look at your skin, there is different wavelength of light that uh, enter the body, and some of those help you generate more vitamin D, but some of them also have immune modulating uh, capabilities. And looking at the different spectrums of light, I mean, um, that's another thing is light diet, like how you deal with different spectrums of light. And um, very popular technology today is the red light devices. And I think, again, you basically mimic the sun. You've evolved with that source of light for 300,000 years or something like that. So it's pretty obvious that, you know, more this type of really bright bluish light in the morning and then towards the red and the sunset and all that. So I think many people are pretty familiar with the idea. In, in terms of light, I think actually this room is pretty safe because uh, these kind of UV lights have been shown to actually kill Pathogenic, yeah. Uh, yeah. different fire pathogenic. The air here. Yeah, we'll and red light, uh, light. There are studies actually on also respiratory uh, infections. If you just use it like five to ten minutes on the area, if you feel any kind of like coughing or kind of kind of a feeling of possibly getting sick, five to ten minutes red light, and that it's a dramatic help. Yeah. Uh, about hormesis, so uh, you can do hormesis definitely outside. Uh, avant the pool, cold dips, and the sauna, and alterating that. Also, sunlight is a form of hormesis. Exercise is a form of hormesis. But too much is not beneficial. It actually might be harmful. You might not be in the optimal curve of the hormesis. Reducing your reactive oxygen species is key here. And when you get sick, that's when reactive oxygen species start to rise and kind of gets you into a vicious cycle and it's very hard to get out. So that in enables and speeds up viral replication as well. That's why you want to have good playing cards to start from to deal with something like that. Good playing cards you can also play by having a really strong gut lining and uh, issues in the gut lining, um, so-called leaky gut and, and many other like irritable bowel syndromes and so on are definitely increasing low-level inflammation and also immune system will be more active and it has too much things to do so when potential pathogens come in that you really want to deal with you know the resources might have run out so that's why you want to fix your gut lining first all disease starts in the gut like Hippocrates said 
and Oli can maybe tell a little bit more about some of the tools. Yeah, uh, you, you might have heard the saying that uh, strong immunity begins in the gut or 70% of your immunity resides in the gut. But, but there's a truth to that because um, at these times so many people have a poor uh, condition of the gut, especially the gut lining, but also the gut immune system called GALT. So uh, that is very potent, but uh, you can actually kind of biohack it with, uh, for example, lactoferrin. Uh, lactoferrin is also um, having multiple other functions. Uh, glutamine uh, as an amino acid, it's one of the best uh, ways to really fix the gut lining, and it's also kind of a fuel for the epithelial cells in the gut. Uh, about microbial diversity, this is a cool picture about uh, industrialized versus hunter-gatherer uh, diets and, or tribes, what we usually see and what I've seen with patients is that the gut microbial diversity is very narrow. So the more wide and more diverse it is, it automatically, automatically means that you have a better immune system. You can prove it with the probiotics. There are certain strains like uh, Lactobacillus plantarum, and they're, they're known to really uh, upregulate the T cells. And uh, prebiotics, if you think about what they do, they feed the good guys in the gut. Mm. So go with this. And that's why a diverse diet with a lot of uh, different kind of plants and uh, prebiotics is the way to go. But you don't want to be eating all the time as well. So intermittent fasting, how many... <laughs> does intermittent fasting regularly. For me personally, I think that has been one of the best ways or tools to improve immune system. It doesn't have to be very dramatic, but we know that it upregulates glutathione production, the master antioxidant, uh, autophagy, which about Simlan talked about quite a bit, and also increase ketone bodies. And ketone bodies have been shown to also improve the immune system and the resilience against different kinds of respiratory bacteria. And of course, you get the benefits of mitochondria when you have better function in mitochondria. They also, that also means that your immune cells work better because they have more energy. And, Still, more, <laughs> and more energy means what? I'm You're used a to good them flow. talking all the time. It's in a but, flow state, continue. Yeah. Uh, NAD, that's the golden molecule that's really um, regulating everything in the mitochondria. You can use it or increase it in various ways, but this slide is kind of a, <laughs> kind of a blurry. Yeah, but if you go deeper into Seamland's um, presentations, you get a ton of information about this. The basic pathway is nuclear uh, factor erythroid 2, <laughs> 2 related factor 2 or NRF2. So that activates over 500 genes um, called sirtuins. You can do it with exercise, calorie restriction, very easy to restrict your calories with intermittent fasting, and also different kind of natural uh, plant compounds. Maybe Jaco can, Jaco, tell, Jaco about can tell about yeah, I this. think actually it's interesting. We often lump these hormetic stressors into the category of xenohormetic, so coming from outside. But if you're more precise, there are molecular sources of hormesis and then env environmental sources of hormesis. And of course, most of the strong color pigments and you know, essential oils and alkaloids in plants have been communicating with us, basically saying that if you eat too much of me, I'll kill you and all this. So these are the things that activate these pathways. And that's one of the key reasons why we need it from the many different different genetic sources, different types of plants and different types of molecules from the nature. So when you practice these, you know, Kung Fu skills, uh, you, you kind of make your body more resilient, uh, considering psychological and biological threats, uh, you're already pretty well prepared. Now, going into prevention, you want to move from yourself to looking at your environment. And air quality is very important. I, smoke, I spoke shortly about smoking, but also pollution. Like there is apps like Air Matters, and you can check what kind of um, 
whether it is in terms of pollution, like how many microparticles there are in the air, and these PM 2.5 kind of uh, particles are the most dangerous ones. They enter uh, in your lungs, and then they go directly to the bloodstream, and they increase all-cause mortality independent of all other factors. And respiratory issues are on the rise because of the po pollution that's been going on in the world. And the way how you kind of use this is you open up this app and you check what part of the city you are in, what time of the day the air is cleanest. That's when you want to exercise outside. And you want to avoid the moments when the pollution is highest because when your respiration increases, you can imagine that that speed at which this crap enters your bloodstream also accelerates. And one of the best investments in your home, in your office, in your bedroom, is some kind of air filtration technology. And if you want to go really hi-fi with this, you get Nava, a Finnish company. They have their cool green walls here. And these are filtering the air, not just through the plant leaves, like plants are known to reduce volatile organic compounds. They also increase oxygen levels in the room. But through the root system, it's even more effective at removing uh, environmental pollutants. And you also get higher humidity, which is really good at this time of the year. So get a humidifier, get some plants this time of the year, because it's known that cold weather, dry air, increases transmission of disease. And you have these hairs in your nose, and those need to be wet for them to be able to uh, capture pathogens. And I think core idea there is to scale up the idea that we have a microbiome or on our acid mandel on our skin we have certain bacteria. But in your home, think about it as a biome. And you can affect that by all kinds of means, not just plants, but you, know, you can use probiotics on your home, basically. So that's a, a very important idea to scale up from our bodies into our environment. But of course, the best thing you could do is to escape you know, the box you're living in. And uh, actually, that's a therapy method in Japan called Shinrin-yoku. Uh, three years ago, I had a presentation about the health benefit of nature. And there are immense, like even 10 minutes is, uh, has a beautiful effects. If you really want to boost or upregulate the immune system, spend two hours in the forest and really intake the whole forest with all of your senses into your system. Uh, I moved from a super hectic center into this quite forest-like environment with about uh, 2,500 2, square meters of space, different ecosystems in my home, home yard. And I go there every morning and usually after work, I go there if I'm not going to the forest. Uh, forest can actually be also uh, moved into different locations, and this is called uh, kunta. And there's this new research on daycare children, and they noticed that if they put this piece of forest into the daycare outside, it really improved the microbial diversity of the children, and also because of that, the immune system, the plasma, G GF, beta-1 levels, <laughs> and so on. But basically, these different kind of interleukins and immune modulators that are positively associated to a stronger immune system. Very, that happened very quickly. And those uh, daycare locations were like made out of concrete and the yards and all that. And, and when they let the children deal with the plants and uh, take care of the garden, their health also started improving. and. Um, their ability to deal with things like type 2 diabetes, potentially blood sugar control, all of that, uh, the microbial diversity increased. So these things are extremely important. And here is a company called Luoncos, and they have this cosmetic product that you can put on your skin. It's not only a probiotic for your skin, but it's basically an extract of the forest floor that's in it. And when you put it on your skin, you can emulate some of the effects that you would get by living close to nature in forest environments. So the way out modulates things in your body go even more beyond. And they are 
talking about that at their stand. Check it out. It's a cool product. Um, it's more than just a probiotic skincare product. It's based on some recent research that uh, was done in Finland by Uute Scientific. And again, to me, it's funny that uh, in medicine, it's been basically a para paradigm that now like, well, we don't really have anything that quickly enhances your immune system. It's a complex system and it takes time. And then it's like, you know, you go 20 minutes into your yeah. nature and all the NK cells. And so uh, that's very interesting to me. Yeah. If you think about, you know, the recommendations we have right now to use hand sanitizers and all that, I mean, washing your hands was a lifesaver in Second World War and First World War when they discovered these things in the invisible world we call bacteria. But when you use hand sanitizer, the researchers figured out that it can actually destroy a lot of the bacteria, but what is resistant very easily to it is different fung fungi. Not the good ones. Uh, and you can get more easily fungal infections. But it, it's, the dose makes the poison here. It's okay to use them occasionally. They did studies on people who are working as cashiers and using hand sanitizers. But if you are using it every freaking 15 minutes, you can increase skin problems and skin conditions. The other thing that can happen there is because you are basically destroying the cell walls. Um, there can be happen what Joshua, the guy who invented the, and figured out as a Nobel Prize the transfer of genes from one bacterial species to another. This can happen when they have cell-to-cell -cell contact. So you get this horizontal transfer of DNA. And what can happen, you can actually breed in your hands a super bacteria that is resistant to hand sanitizer by, by one species getting the gene se sequence that makes it resistant from another species. And, and uh, we know in hospitals that there is already bacteria that is resistant to all these cleaning agents. And we are basically doing now a massive global scale experiment, which is akin to what we did with Roundup and other pesticides in our agriculture. So we have to be very conscious about what we are doing when we fight, you know. You have to be intelligent. In, in terms of Kung Fu, you know, you are a real master if you don't need to use any force, if you know what you are doing, and you know exactly the time when you use it. You don't use excess force. That's always what they learn about. Now about air filtration. Um, there's this discussion about increasing car carbon dioxide levels, it's super dangerous. But I mean, you can, you can definitely, with technology, you can develop things that don't increase that. Like the device I use, it has nanotechnology, turbines. I actually get more oxygen into my system. I can use it a long time, just fine. Uh, the, I, I hope this our air similar technology will uh, become more popular. And um, uh, we have also the Luft cubes at our standard. It's using photocatalysis. It's basically using ultraviolet light to destroy in the air viral and bacterial uh, compounds of anything that goes through it. It's kind of your personal, you know, um, bubble. vacuum bubble yeah. in which, you know, pathogens don't get to you. But it's in interesting about this device, even though it's, it's super small, the radius is over two meters. So it creates a kind of a very big bubble, as you said, and uh, especially good in airplanes, but also in co-working spaces yeah. and so on. I often use when I'm on a boat or train or you can put it in your car. If you're a taxi driver, I would get one of those, like humming in the car, and, <laughs> or if you're a passenger. So what about masks? You know, there is a lot of discussion about that. If you want to understand the future, study history. Yeah, I think it was in Orwell's novel, 1984. The one who controls past, basically history, controls your current, current and your future. Now, Karl Marx has said that history repeats itself the first as strategy and then as farce. And, you know, what we are going through here, we have forgotten that we got, we've been through this already once. When Spanish flu hit in Finland, the local health authorities published news articles that avoid public gatherings, uh, you know, dancing and, and things like that. And uh, there was shops closing and people going bankrupt and it was, it was haywire everywhere, like, um, they tried to avoid, you know, all these things happening. And there was all these ads to wear a mask, um, 
and you're basically saving lives by doing this. And uh, basically, it, it, it became very, very political. Wear a mask or go to jail. Sounds familiar? And then all things evolve, just like in nature. You have force, and then you have counterforce. And then came the anti-mask meetings, shooting people who didn't use masks. We've gone through all of this already. Haven't we learned something here? So what about masks? I think it's way too political to comment on it right now. But check out that link. There is 10 professors who have gathered all what they know about aerosols. And I always trust more experts who really use 24 hours on stuff, and they used all their life to study these things. It's very, very important that we, you know, trust the experts on these things. I use a mask every time I go to a public toilet because of fecal plume. It basically explodes, you know, when you flush the toilet and all these aerosols fly around. And that's why you should never use, like, this... Um, what are these kind of things you put your hands in? Yeah, dryers. Dryers. They're, they're like massive incubators and they really like explode all the stuff in there. And we have actually found with studies that they, they are literally viral and bacterial incubators. You know, every people put in their hands there and they are not usually self-sanitizing. Although some of these have UV lights, but it's, it's not really enough. Always use, I would use the soap and paper. Yeah. There is a study that now came from China that they studied one, one building uh, specifically where coronavirus spread from one family to another. And they, there was apartments where there, no one lived and they were able to take surface samples. And they found, you know, the virus everywhere in the toilets. And um, I think that's the viral vector. That's the real problem. You know, social distancing, cool, but going to toilet might be your biggest risk. So if you, if you want to do a public service, close the lid, before you flush, please. Thank you. Now, <laughs> diesel plume, <laughs> done. Um, we could talk about things for a long time, but if you get, you know, symptoms, what would you do? Uh, first of all, you have to upregulate up vitamin D. This is uh, vitamin D and measure it. Get it over 100 nanomoles per liter. When you get sick or you feel any kind of symptoms, really mega dose with zinc and as often as possible. 50 milligrams five times per day, especially zinc as that is the way to go. Another one is vitamin C. And it's been shown in multiple studies that if you take 1,000 milligrams every hour for the first six hours, that has a dramatic effect. You can shorten the duration of a flu but you don't necessarily prevent it with vitamin C, like some people think. But unless you are an athlete, uh, if you are a highly stressed athlete, you have a high physical demand, then vitamin C can actually prevent from getting sick. Exactly. But Does, don't use it around the workouts because it's actually harmful. Yeah, all of those cruciferous vegetables, onions, garlic, high in sulfur bearing amino acids and all of these inducers of glutathione in essence. So definitely more broccoli and red onions and all that. Continue. Yeah, well, yeah selenium. <laughs> also a super, super antiviral and important uh, nutrient that's low in our soil. So I would say that, for example, from Whole Foods, Brazil nuts and many of these things, just make sure that you are actually getting selenium in a way that it's absorbed. Um, that's, the, that? that's the cool stuff that fights yeah. RNA, RNA, RNA viruses, viruses RNA, such, RNA, such as coronavirus and other, other yes. these kind of... Yeah, that was the original like, list of, yeah. of supplements that were found, so... Ferlic acid. Where do you get that? What? Ferlic acid. acid. Well, I have a demonstration later today that I'll make a chocolate drink with all the mushrooms and all that, so then we'll get more hands-on, but cacao and chocolate are super high in that. I think you have everything that's going to fight RNA viruses yeah. in that blend. And again, <laughs> dark, highly pigmented berries. It's not just elderberry, but, you know, choke berries, bilberries, acai, you name it. These all have the same types of, of compounds that are really helpful and traditionally used for the respiratory system. Licorice, not just lowering stress, but 
highly medicinal herb that's often overlooked. I know actually a few doctors that chewed on licorice because they found the studies on, on the ILG mm-hmm. and they, they work the, in the, like the primary care and they, <laughs> they chewed on uh, licorice. But of course, they are not telling you about this, but and it's an am- <laughs> amplifier. If you look at any system, it's often used to yeah. enhance the properties of other stuff. I like to put licorice into my coffee as a powder. It's amazing taste. Like, it's, it's, yeah. it's incredible. Amazing. It's amazing. It's the best coffee ever. Best. Again, beetroot, cacao, all of these things that basically open up your blood vessels, vasodilation, good before sex, anything that you want to actually use to enhance the vascular capacity and that. Um, I'll kind of talk more about medicinal mushrooms in a moment, but that's my pretty much go-to when it comes that I have covered the vitamin D and all the other aspects. This is kind of the protein for your immune system, kind of the the stuff that you feed to train your immune system to be more adaptable. Yeah, not everything works. If you go to the pharmacy, there are a lot of stuff that do not work. And that can make actually things even worse. So NSAIDs, anti-inflammatory drugs, they're good for the pain, but they make you uh, getting or being sick longer because they inhibit the resolution process of the infection and the inflammation. Also, paracetamol has been shown to be actually harmful if you think about the, the function of the immune system. It is effective against pain, but there are also many other methods. Cough medications usually don't work. Uh, antihistamines might make your immune system worse. They have been shown to actually lower the immune response. So be very mindful about this. So, you know, poison is in the dose. One pill here and there is not as bad. But if you take it two weeks, then you might have some problems. And we are not promoting, we are not like saying don't take pharmaceutical drugs. They have their place. They are scientific tools that we have developed. There is many, many good things that work, but those are like you know kung fu moves as well. You know, you have to be very conscious yeah, how you very, use very them. wise and very strategic. Yeah, like antibiotics, they have their place. They can be a difference between life and death, but you know it's 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 really a a weapon you have to learn to use properly. If you want to learn more, check out the Bikers Flu Guide. Bike.to/flu/download. And I started with Chinese um, Kung Fu and, you know, martial arts. And I want to finish up with Japanese martial arts. I have practiced Tai Chi, the Chinese, and Wushu. And I have also practiced Japanese uh, Judo and as, as well as Aikido. And Morihei Ueshiba, who was the founding father of Aikido, he learned all the different weapon systems. He practiced, you know, perfected every weapon. And then came the moment when he realized that the most advanced weapon is the one that you don't have to use. So he developed Aikido, where you still see the weapon in a way if you know what you're searching for, but it's invisible. It's an invisible hand, invisible sword that he's using. And it's more advanced. And he thinks that you know, the true, you know, mastery of any martial art is when you don't have to use it at all. You influence your opponent in a way that the opponent becomes your friend. So think about that when you get online to debates about, you know, who's right and who's wrong, and if this is a pandemic or a pandemic or whatever it is. You know, those are your friends living on this freaking ecosystem, you know, your brothers and sisters. And we have to find, you know, a way together through this. And you know what? Morihei Ueshiba did, very often he did something called misogi. It's Japanese Shinto ritual purification, where he goes to cold water uh, under a waterfall and meditates. And when he was doing this, he explains, around 2 a.m. as I was performing cold water misogi, I suddenly forgot all the martial techniques I had ever learned. The techniques of my teachers appeared completely new. Now they were vehicles for the cultivation of life, knowledge, and virtue. Virtue, the stoic ideas, not devices to throw people with. May help be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.